On this episode of Women Behind Bars, one woman was caught on tape shooting at the home of a former business associate and then eluded authorities for over a year. I just wanted to scare her. When I shot, I shot high. I wanted her to feel the way I felt. When I was sick, I wanted her to feel helpless. The video gives us a very clear picture of exactly how close these people came to dying that night. Then Lori Worley is found guilty in the fatal stabbing of her son-in-law after her daughter dies of a drug overdose. He was laughing because my daughter was dead. He put the kitchen knife to his chest, and I went over and I popped it into his chest. I should stop because my baby was dead. I believe that Lori Worley ran out of the bedroom and grabbed a bigger knife. As Josh began to exit out into the kitchen, Lori Worley attacked him. And when he went down, she continued to stab him. Two women, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of Courtney Savage and Lori Worley. In the early morning hours of September 7, 2006, Courtney Savage, a former police officer, drove up to the home of her friend and business associate, Christina, and pulled out a gun. The suspect approached the house to this location and fired six rounds from a six-shot revolver. All I can remember is hearing the sound of glass just shattering all around me, and then my baby was crying. The infant suffered a minor cut from a smashed mirror. Fortunately, all eight residents survived the attack with no further injuries. Christina turned to her security cameras for answers. When I first watched it, my heart just completely stopped. It hit me then, oh my god, that's Courtney. Authorities arrested Christina's friend, Courtney Savage. The 31-year-old admitted to the shooting, but insisted she never intended to hurt or kill anyone. Courtney believed that Christina owed her money, and that may have driven why she acted the way she did. She was going to dictate her own form of justice. And the facts show that her intent was not to scare, but was to kill. If I wanted to kill Christina, it was easier ways. I was trying to make her feel helpless the way I had felt when she ran the business to the ground. Did Courtney Savage plan to murder her friend by firing a round of bullets into her home? Or was she only trying to intimidate her into paying back a debt? My childhood was rough, not in the sense that I had a bad upbringing, but I just was not a happy child. I didn't have a father, and we didn't live in a big home with expensive cars and money to throw around. It made me feel inferior. We would drive around the neighborhood and you could sense there was a little bit of uh, envy. She realized that the only way that she was going to have anything is if she did it herself. By the age of 13, Courtney developed a fixation on making money. It was an obsession that would later haunt her as an adult. She loved money. She loved making it and saving it. And she wanted to go to work as soon as she possibly could. I can remember her ironing off the dollar bills that she had earned. She was so proud. Having money made me feel secure and stable and carefree. The teenager maintained a B average at school while juggling her various jobs. In 1993, the high school graduate started her career search. I wanted a job that was different every day. And I read in the paper about the Corrections Academy, and I said, why not? Courtney moved to Florida and attended corrections classes in Newport Ritchie. There, she met classmate David Savage. David and I started out as, as friends. He used to pull my hair and punch me like we were in third grade. He was not my type. He really just grew on me. Soon, the two began dating. In 1996, Courtney graduated from the program and enrolled in a law enforcement academy in Tampa. I did a stint at uh, Hillsborough um, Sheriff's Office as detention deputy, and it was a boring job. I was working part-time. And I was looking for something that was going to be cash. And I fell upon an ad for 
aromatherapists. We used natural products to heighten the senses. I wouldn't say it was massage because we'd have to be licensed for that. Let's say um, light touch, body rub type of thing. The 22-year-old continued to work as a detention deputy, but also took a job at the store, Fantasy and Lingerie, to explore her new endeavor. While working in the field, she bonded with fellow aromatherapist, Christina. Christina was a good friend. I always could call her and uh, talk to her about anything, and she always listened. We didn't really have a whole lot in common, but we got along very well. We were best friends. Unsure of which path to take, Courtney pursued both occupations. In 1999, she received an associate's degree in criminal justice. That March, she and David decided to tie the knot. We married in Las Vegas. You go to a little chapel, you get married, and you can go gambling in the same night. It was great. The newlyweds both joined the Tampa Police Department. Courtney became a reserve officer, while David took on the role of full-time cop. Hoping to augment their income, Courtney opened her own aromatherapy business called The Den in 2003. I had a fully stocked showroom with the lingerie, clothes, stuff for the alternative lifestyle. Then I had three uh, themed session rooms where we did aromatherapy. I had clientele, and all the girls I hired to work for me had clientele, so the business was successful. The young proprietor hired her friend Christina to help out at the shop. I gave her a key, and she would come and open if I couldn't make it in time, and she looked out for me. Courtney's business was booming, and she left her job at the police department. But in the fall of 2004, she began experiencing dental problems. They were starting to chip and crumble. The enamel was coming off, so I decided that I wanted to have them all fixed. She had priced the cost of having her teeth capped, and it was prohibitive in the United States. So she found a couple of dentists in Mexico that would do it for $6,000 as opposed to 50. When I went to Mexico for my teeth, everything went well, and it, the teeth looked great. But it, within about a month, I started to get very, very sick. I had ulcers in my mouth. I had widespread body pain. I started coming down with grand mal seizures. I was having extreme anxiety attacks, periods of delirium. It was, it was, it was insane. I didn't really notice a change when she first came back. She just wasn't coming to work, but then I had heard that she had started using prescription medications. I went from doctor to doctor. They just kept on giving me more drugs, more Xanax, more antidepressants. I definitely became addicted. I was so sick, I just wanted to die. She thought this might have been due to the fact that the amalgam in her teeth was all metal. But toxic poisoning is one of those things that's still not a proven scientific malady. Although Courtney's husband, David, was supportive during the illness, their marriage began to suffer. David was helping me try to look into getting some help, but he didn't know what to do. They were fighting a lot. She wasn't going home a lot of times. It was just not going to last. By April of 2005, Courtney says she had become too ill to tend to her aromatherapy business. She turned to her friend of eight years and made her an offer. I decided to turn the business over to Christina. She was ecstatic. She thanked me, made me promises. According to Courtney, Christina verbally agreed to a number of conditions. The merchandise she had to continue to sell and I would receive the income from that. And the main stipulation I required was that she remained in business. Everything was um, signed over to me on April 1st and she just didn't have anything to do with it after that. Courtney claims the shop was making $80,000 a year when she handed it over to Christina. But within a few months of the exchange, the business hit a snag. The landlords told me that the, she hadn't been paying rent. They had to put a formal eviction order. I was in disbelief and I was shocked. And that turned into anger. Courtney never gave me any indication that she was angry that the store was closed. I had made a phone call to tell her that we were not going to be allowed to stay there any longer. And then she came, and she got all of her merchandise. Not only does Courtney deny this, but claims she could not get a hold of Christina for months. She owed me thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. I felt entirely helpless. I was sick. 
and I felt like she was taking advantage of that. And that just, it just made it twice as bad. I said to Courtney, why don't you take her to civil court? She said to me, if I do that, I'll never get anything. The only way I felt I was gonna be feel satisfied is if I basically took matters into my own hands. By the summer of 2006, Courtney Savage, a 31-year-old former police officer turned entrepreneur, was desperate to get back thousands of dollars and personal belongings from her friend Christina. I called her and called her, and she wouldn't answer her cell phone, or she was out of minutes. A year earlier, Courtney had fallen ill and given Christina her aromatherapy business free of charge. But within months, the shop was evicted from its space. According to Courtney, Christina had broken their verbal agreement. One of the stipulations is that the business remained open and that there was a job for me when I got better. And when I found out that the business was going under, I became furious. There was a certain degree of pride. And Courtney didn't want to see something that she had nurtured to go down the tubes. Courtney made a trip down with her mom, and she actually did two truckloads of different things that she wanted. According to Courtney, it was not enough. She wanted to get back at Christina and felt that Christina should pay in some way for what she had done to Courtney. I never had any indication that she was angry about anything. On July 10th, 2006, at 3.30 a.m., the front windows of Christina's new business called Hidden Treasures were smashed in. Less than an hour later, bullets grazed Christina's home. It was surreal. Never did I really think we were intentionally being targeted. When police arrived at the residence, they discovered the bullets had only struck the vehicles in the driveway. We asked if she had anybody that was mad at her, if she owed anybody any money. She told us that she knew of no one else that could be after her. Authorities combed the area and questioned neighbors, but had no leads. Then on August 9th, the shooter struck again. It happened at approximately the same time, and it was the same type incident. There were gunshots, there were vehicles that were damaged, and the family was visibly scared. Fearing additional shootings, detectives moved Christina and her family to a motel. We stayed away for a couple of days, but I thought, whoever it is, they would be able to find us anyways. Detective Lewis said, why about putting in a camera? And I started taping every single night. I had driven all the way up there, thinking, OK, I can't get her on the phone. Maybe I can catch her coming home from work. I was just so angry that I've gone through this for over a year at this time. And I always keep a firearm in, in my car. I had a concealed weapons permit. And I just lost it and shot at the house. She'd gotten out of her car, walked to the front of the home, lifted her arm and fired that gun six separate times into the face of the home. The shots were way louder than the two prior times. It felt like they were right there. I just wanted to scare her. When I shot, I shot high. I wanted her to feel the way I felt when I was sick. I wanted her to feel um, helpless. All eight family members inside the home, including five young children, survived the shooting. The only injury was a minor cut to the arm of Christina's infant daughter. I put the tape in. I knew it was a girl, but it didn't hit me until at one point in the tape, she literally turns around and walks back to her car. Christina, after watching the video, knew. She recognized Courtney Savage. And based on that, law enforcement pursued her as a suspect. Surveillance team started trailing Courtney and discovered she was driving a rental car that matched the vehicle in the video. Meanwhile, Christina called Courtney while police listened in. Christina was trying to get Courtney to say if she did, in fact, shoot at her house on three different occasions, and also to see what her motive was. I just wanted her to admit that she had done it. And I asked her, what do I got to do to make you stop doing this? And that's when she told me $2,000. I've been told me that I've been told me about $2,000. OK, if I tell you tonight, will the shooting stop? If there's bigger than money you owe me, we're straight. Christina told her former business associate to meet at a local restaurant for the exchange. 
Little did Courtney know that the authorities were there waiting to make the arrest. I remember a man coming out of nowhere and swung open my car door and dragged me out of the car, threw me on the ground, and I'm being tasered. And then all of a sudden, there's all these police officers everywhere. Inside her vehicle was a book on how to make a silencer for handguns, a police raid jacket, and other objects that showed she possibly had other intentions of just trying to scare Christina. Detectives charged Courtney with shooting into an occupied dwelling and then took her into custody for questioning. Post Miranda, Courtney did admit to shooting at Christina's house on three separate occasions. In addition, she admitted that she had smashed a window out of Christina's business but Courtney maintains she only committed one shooting and says she doesn't remember confessing to all three. I could have admitted to it. I, I know I just wanted to go home. I, I just figured the quicker, I tell them whatever they want to hear, uh, charge me with the shooting occupied dwelling. I have no record. How much time was I really looking at? And after speaking with her for several hours, there's no doubt in my mind that she's a sociopath. Based on the fact of how she spoke, how she showed no remorse, I specifically asked her the question if she would have been upset if she killed one of the kids in the house, and she said not at all. I would never have said that. I was delirious at the time, and I think I was probably joking with detectives. Courtney told police she had used a 357 Magnum revolver that was stowed at her grandmother's home. Her family was shocked by the news. It was so unlike her. She never showed any evidence of violence throughout her entire life. She was definitely depressed when she did this, temporarily insane, over-medicated, and physically ill. Less than 24 hours after the shooting, Courtney was taken to the county jail. The state attorney's office then began their own investigation. She took various measures to conceal what she had done. She rented a car to facilitate these crimes. She wore a mask to go undetected. It was obvious that her intention was to kill. To strengthen their case, the prosecution turned to forensic specialist Woody Miller to trace the path of the bullets using laser technology. Since we knew from the video where the shooting had occurred, it gave us a very good starting point. Once we were able to get the laser to pass through the hole in the window and through to its final resting spot, it gives us a very clear picture of exactly how close these people came to dying that night. Miller discovered one bullet came within a foot of a sleeping child. And based on that, we decided to file charges of attempted murder. I thought that was absolutely ridiculous. I absolutely never planned to kill Christina. The state attorney's office had a very strong case against her. I didn't think there was any way to resolve the case without some period of prison time. Because of Florida's strict gun laws, Courtney faced anywhere from 20 years to life in prison. I thought, oh, god, I, I got to leave because I, this is ridiculous. They're going to try to send me to prison for life, and nobody was even injured. I knew that I had to get up some cash, and the only way to do that was to get divorced. In an amicable arrangement, Courtney's husband, David, agreed to buy out her half of their home. With the money received from the divorce settlement, Courtney was able to post the $115,500 bond. She got out of jail and vanished. The 32-year-old was now a fugitive. Nothing is more important than, than your freedom. And it has something that had to be done. I went to Oklahoma and uh, blended in. On July 20th, 2007, 32-year-old Courtney Savage was due in court for a pretrial hearing. The former police officer turned aromatherapist was facing eight counts of attempted murder after video footage captured her shooting into the occupied home of her friend, Christina. She had been involved in a business with Christina. And law enforcement's theory was Courtney did these things because uh, Christina owed her money from the failed business. She made bond late April 2007. And her bond was going to be readdressed by the judge. And Courtney did not appear for that hearing, and I never saw her again. When she didn't appear, that's when we took action. Warrants were issued for her arrest, and further investigation was conducted to determine where, in fact, she had gone to. I was a nervous wreck. It was extremely difficult. I went to a place where I knew nobody, never been before, and started out as uh, somebody else. Courtney felt that everybody was against her. She was convinced that she would not do well in any way with the outcome of the case. 
So she was intent on, on running away. Though detectives traced Courtney from state to state, they were always one step behind. After more than a year, the search was at a standstill. We used the assistance of the United States Marshal Service to help us try to locate Courtney. During this time, we were contacted by America's Most Wanted, who offered their assistance in this case. I knew about 48 hours in advance that they were going to be airing uh, the America's Most Wanted about me. I thought it was ridiculous. I mean, I thought that was reserved for murderers and serious crimes. On September 20th, 2008, America's Most Wanted aired an episode highlighting the case of Courtney Savage. That was the first time I had seen the videotape of the shooting. And I was devastated because I had a feeling that it wouldn't be much time before Courtney would be caught. Within hours of the broadcast, detectives started receiving calls. There was upwards of 20 tips received nationwide. Two of the tips actually led us to Texas. Just 48 hours later, Courtney was captured in Humble, Texas. I was driving into my apartment, and I noticed a man standing outside, which seemed like he didn't fit in. And it was like everything was in slow motion. Courtney was extradited back to Florida, where she ultimately signed a plea agreement. I was afraid to take it to trial because I was, I was guilty, but not of attempted murder. But the way the justice system is, who knew? And if I was convicted, they would give me a life sentence. So I felt like I had no other choice. Under Florida's 1020 life gun law, Courtney received a minimum mandatory sentence of 20 years in prison, followed by 10 years probation. You get 10 years minimum mandatory if you possess a gun during the commission of a crime. You will get no less than 20 years if you discharge that gun. And you will get 25 years to life if you cause serious bodily harm to someone. While Courtney accepts responsibility for her actions, she and her family believe the punishment does not fit the crime. I think a 20-year sentence is insanely outlandish. Nobody was injured. I have no prior record. It still baffles me. I think it was the prosecution wanting retaliation because Courtney had been a law enforcement officer at one time. Courtney Savage was not treated any differently than anyone else. Gun violence is certainly very serious, regardless of your background. Courtney is currently serving her sentence at a maximum security prison in Ocala, Florida. I'm uh, training to be a law clerk. Now I realize that nobody needs money, nobody needs all the material possessions we think we do. She has filed a post-conviction relief and maintains that while she is guilty of shooting into an occupied dwelling, she never intended to kill anyone. I'm arguing mitigating factors, which was my toxic poisoning. I never would have done what I did if it wasn't for the heavy metal poisoning. The facts show that Courtney did intend to kill. There was no indication of, of insanity on her part. And I think her actions and her statements all reflect that she knew what she was doing. Courtney has not spoken to Christina since the shooting. It wasn't about the $2,000. It was much more personal than that. I felt that Christina betrayed me. I hope that Courtney, at some point in time, accepts that what she did was wrong. And when she gets released, I hope that she can make a life for herself. I take the blame for the shooting. Um, I don't feel any remorse in the fact that nobody was injured. I do feel guilty for it scaring the children. But as far as Christina's concerned, I don't think it's anything in comparison to what she, what she put me through. At 3.39 a.m. on September 24, 2004, police responded to an alarming 911 call. On the phone was 43-year-old Lori Worley. She told authorities her son-in-law had stabbed himself repeatedly. Police arrived within minutes, but the horrific scene told a much different story than what Lori described. There were stab wounds on his back, and I immediately knew that 
that was not a suicide. The scene was very gruesome. There was blood on the floors, blood on the walls. Detectives determined 20-year-old Josh Blankenship had been stabbed 44 times in the chest and stomach. Police questioned Lori, Josh's mother-in-law. Lori explained to us that she assisted him in stabbing himself. He picked up the uh, knife, and then he started off like this, scratching himself, and then he started jabbing, 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 jabbing. Lori's daughter, Kelly, who was married to Josh, had died two days earlier from a cocaine overdose. Lori would later tell police that Josh claimed he helped Kelly commit suicide, provoking her into a frenzy. According to Lori, Josh was laughing and stabbing himself and claiming that he had administered the fatal dose. After he said, I killed Kelly, Lori lost it. She said it was like a rage just took her over. But authorities believed Lori had other reasons to dispose of her son-in-law. Lori told the police that Josh was a Satan worshiper, and she was quite anxious that her granddaughter not live with Josh. His family's not good. They're Satan worshipers. And nobody will ever bring that baby to see these. Did Lori Worley deliberately stab Josh Blankenship in order to gain custody of her granddaughter? Or was she provoked into murdering him when he claimed he killed her beloved daughter? We were a close-knit family, and we all got along pretty good. We rode horses a lot, and my dad had a farm. The youngest of three, Lori looked up to her older sister, Stephanie. We took dance. Oh, she loved to tap dance. She was in a few beauty contests, and she enjoyed that. In high school, the teenage beauty joined the gymnastics team and excelled. I thought she did well enough, and probably it could have been a dream for her at some time to maybe even look at the Olympics. But her athletic pursuits were cut short when she became pregnant in her junior year. On March 23, 1978, Lori gave birth to a baby boy. The whole family chipped in to raise the newborn. He had more mamas than he knew what to do with. He's always known that Lori is his natural mother but my mom and dad adopted him. Shortly after giving birth, the 18-year-old enrolled in a junior college in Mississippi. Lori went to college for a total of six years, studied two different disciplines. She studied drafting. She took a lot of math courses. She was, wanted to be an architect. As a drafting student, Lori started dating Steve Nevels, a local mechanic. In 1979, they decided to marry. Lori became pregnant, and they were very happy to have a baby coming. At just seven and a half months pregnant, Lori went into labor on September 1st, 1980. She called the baby girl Kelly. It was a little scary right there at first, a little touch and go. She had the IVs, and her skin was very transparent, but she picked up very quickly. But Lori's marriage didn't survive. Some family members say she started using drugs to cope with the pressure of being a single parent. She worked a lot, and it was hard trying to make ends meet, so it was a very stressful time. But Kelly was well taken care of. In 1989, Lori married for a second time, but that relationship, too, ended in divorce. Her daughter, Kelly, was the only constant in her life. They were always together and had become very dependent on one another emotionally. And uh, Kelly had a lot of anxiety. Back to being a single mother, Lori became overwhelmed with financial struggles. Between 1992 and 1998, she was in and out of jail for grand theft and forgery. She had several brushes with the law, at least two felony convictions, and two misdemeanors involving dishonesty. She felt her situation was so bad that she may have done some things that were, were not in her and Kelly's best interest. As Lori tells it, Kelly struggled with depression, but some believe the divorcee was manipulating and controlling her teenage daughter. Lori was forcing Kelly to take psych medications and see a psychiatrist, and Kelly didn't feel like there was a need for that. In high school, Kelly became friendly with Josh Blakenship. Although he was four years younger, the two started dating. Josh and Kelly were both into the goth scene, and they liked the same music. They both liked snakes. It was the lifestyle. 
They were like two peas in a pod. Josh, he loved Kelly. He wanted to spend every last minute with her. But Josh's appearance and goth way of life worried Lori. They were into some very dark beliefs. Lori thought he might have worshiped the devil. He had dark hair and a red highlights, and he had some odd tattoos on his shoulder. One that depicted a face of Christ, and then the other, a picture of Satan. They might have been Gothic, but they, he was not a devil worshiper. You know, he went, he went to church with me on Sundays. He was a good kid. He just didn't want the same appearance as everybody. He had some bizarre things up on the walls, uh, a dagger, for example. He was a responsible citizen. He worked as a chef at a local restaurant, and unfortunately, he also used cocaine. In 2004, the young couple decided to tie the knot. Before long, they discovered they were pregnant. I loaned him money to get the pregnancy test. I think he was so happy when it came through positive. Lori was very excited about Kelly being pregnant. She was looking forward to having a little grandchild. On June 21st, 2004, Kelly gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Soon, Lori, who was between homes, moved in with the new parents. According to Josh's family, she forced her way into their lives and took over. Josh and Kelly felt bad and didn't want her to live out on the streets, but they hated her being there. She was real controlling over the baby. She was almost obsessed. But Lori's sister says the couple needed grandma's help. Kelly would call and say, please help me, the baby cries. So Lori would help her because she said she just couldn't do it by herself. Josh wanted her out of the house, and there was a great deal of stress as a result of that. The tension between Josh and Lori became so caustic that police were called numerous times. We responded to this location on several occasions in reference to domestic disputes between Miss Worley and her son-in-law. It was clearly a volatile situation. To make matters worse, the three battled with drug abuse. It was apparent that they were using narcotics there at the home. Lori had an addiction to various prescription drugs. She was unstable and just went overboard in their use. Josh and, and Kelly were cocaine abusers. And a mix of drugs and a young child, young parents, is a recipe for a rotten result. On September 22, 2004, Kelly died from what appeared to be an accidental cocaine overdose. She was in the bathroom at the time, and it caused her to go into convulsions. Lori was in another room caring for her granddaughter. Josh ended up kicking the door in. Unfortunately, she never regained consciousness and was pronounced dead later on that same night. Kelly was 24 years old. Her daughter was only three months. Lori was devastated. She had lost her baby, and of course, she was in shock. She was heartbroken, as any mom would be. On the other hand, she was able to uh, focus and contend with this devastation. She was making arrangements for a funeral, making arrangements to get clothes to wear at the ceremony. And so I think that she was coping. According to the prosecution, Lori then confronted Josh about the future of her granddaughter. Lori considered the child her baby. And uh, after the death of uh, her daughter, wanted to take the child to Mississippi, and Josh had some differing ideas. Josh was absolutely heartbroken. However, he started making plans to put his life back together. Ms. Worley felt threatened that he was going to be taking her granddaughter, and she was anxious that she not be separated from the love of her life now that Kelly was gone. On September 24, 2004, 43-year-old Lori Worley was mourning the death of her daughter, Kelly. Two days earlier, the 24-year-old had gone into cardiac arrest due to a cocaine overdose. Lori was devastated. Kelly's death certainly was unexpected, so she was crushed, just as everybody was. It was a surreal time. Actually, time stopped. It's like, what's happened? Lori turned her attention to the fate of her granddaughter, According to police, she believed her son-in-law worshiped Satan, and she did not want him to get custody of the child. In Florida, grandparents have very little rights, and Lori was afraid that she would lose the child. That night, Josh's aunt was looking after the baby while he and Lori grieved at their home. 
Authorities believe the two began fighting over custody. Josh was very distraught. He told me that he could not stay in that house and that he wanted to come and stay with me. And he said, promise me you'll be here first thing in the morning. And I said, yes, baby, I promise. And that's the last thing that I said. <laughs> Lori claimed that she heard Josh screaming, and she got up and saw him with a knife stabbing himself. And he said, I killed Kelly. And now Kelly's with Satan. And he was laughing, she said, as he admitted that he had knocked Kelly over the head with a bass guitar, causing her to become unconscious, at which point he then injected Kelly with cocaine and said that he and she had a suicide pact, and now it was his time to die. At this point, Lori became overwhelmed with emotion and anger, and he had a knife to his chest. She just helped him push in the knife. She doesn't remember a whole lot after that. She says that she realized what had happened, and she called 911. Officers arrived shortly before 4 a.m. and found Josh's body in the area between the kitchen and the living room. The victim was just inside the doorway uh, on the floor, lying face down in a pool of blood. And there was a lot of blood scattered throughout the residence, on the walls, smear marks everywhere, very gruesome. Josh was pronounced dead at the scene. 44 stab wounds covered his mutilated body, puncturing his heart, lungs, and liver. Authorities turned to Lori for answers. She appeared to be calm and confused. However, during the next several hours, she was interviewed repeatedly on tape, and she appeared to be coherent. She had blood on her hands and on her clothing. She indicated her story that Josh had stabbed himself. He was laughing because my daughter was dead. And he told me he had a pack with her. They were going to die together. And he put the kitchen knife to his chest. And I went over and I popped it into his chest. He had already started making it bleed a little bit, but I put my hand up and I jammed. And then I couldn't stop because my baby was dead. Josh's family was stunned by the news. No, he was not suicidal. Not at all. I was overwhelmed with losing Josh. I still don't believe it. Investigators found a kitchen knife that had been cleaned and placed in Josh's hand. They also discovered a 16-inch decorative dagger with blood on the tip. The evidence was more consistent with a brutal attack. I believe that Lori Worley tried to stab Josh with the dagger, but it's not very sharp. And so it did not kill him. It woke Josh up. Lori ran out of the, the bedroom and grabbed a bigger knife. As Josh began to exit out into the kitchen, Lori Worley attacked him. And when he went down, she continued to stab him. He had crawled from the carpet and start he keep stabbing himself. And um, and then he, he got he got all the way to the cooler and knocked it over on top of himself. This was a blur. This was unexpected. I don't think I did anything wrong. You could see smears where Josh had tried to crawl to the door. You could see that he had tried to get out. Lori was arrested and charged with second degree murder. While preparing for trial, the state of Florida focused on her confession to police and the autopsy results. The medical examiner's conclusion was that this was a homicide, not a suicide. The location of a number of the wounds would have been extremely difficult for Josh to inf have inflicted himself. Lori testified that she just lost it, essentially. She remembers pushing the knife in, and then the next thing she remembers is being in the police car. When a person goes into a rage, uh, many times they don't remember what's happened. It's out of their control. It's a bad thing to lose control to that extent, but she had experienced a devastating loss. Lori also told the jury that Josh was a Satan worshiper who taunted her into stabbing him. There is absolutely no basis to believe that Josh provoked her. 
that was a preposterous and desperate attempt on Lori's part to get away with murder. She killed Josh Blankenship because she wanted to that night. The evidence against Lori was overwhelming. Hoping to minimize prison time, the defense argued for a lesser charge of manslaughter. The killing was done in the uh, heat of passion. In certain circumstances, the law recognized that the emotion rises to such a level that it overwhelms your reason. It doesn't uh, justify the killing, but it does reduce the person's culpability. And if the jury accepted that defense, manslaughter carries a sentence of up to 15 years in prison. So it would have lowered her exposure to prison sentence drastically. I was devastated. He was stabbing himself. She stabbed him. Two wrongs don't make a right. It was wrong all the way around. People say, you know, that the justice at the end, I still don't have my son. She destroyed our lives. The jury saw through her lies, and I believe that they accepted the state's argument that this death was caused because she wanted her granddaughter all to herself. Lori lost her appeal in September of 2005 and has since filed again. She is currently serving her sentence at a maximum security prison in Florida. I think the 40 year sentence is too much. She's had time to reflect on everything that happened. Um, I believe she's definitely learned a lot about herself. She's earned a law clerk certification, so she's able to work in the law library. She's been rebaptized, and she's holding on to her faith. Lori's granddaughter is in the custody of relatives. They have had no contact since Josh's death. It's a tragedy to lose not only two parents in less than two days, but then to have your grandmother be the person responsible for the death of one of those parents. Does she feel remorse for everything that's happened? Yes. Does she feel at fault? Yes. She feels like she should have been able to see the train wreck coming down the line and was too busy putting out little fires. I'm sorry I didn't do what I was supposed to do. It's just that I don't want to lose my family.